All right, so welcome to another episode of FRA. I'm Evan Hafer. Today, I've got Trevor Thompson. Trevor, if you guys haven't caught Trevor, he's been on Joe Rogan's show. Mm -hmm. He's been part of FRA from literally the the beginning, the start. He's a photographer for Black Rifle Coffee. Uh, He's one of my good buddies. Like, so he's an epic human. Uh, He's got a ton of interesting background. He's going to be part of the the FRA components and and cast here. If for a lack of a better term, uh, forever as far as I know. So, oh yeah. The interesting thing I'm running off (laughs) Trevor is we've known each other for several years. So the thing that we were talking about initially was your family's history yeah, and your family's history specifically and how far does it go back with the American and then before that, the, just the military history. Um, and, uh, you know, I, like we were throwing in the joke, like, oh, yeah, is my is my name foreign? And, yeah, Trevor <laughs> yeah, Thompson. Trevor Thompson. Super did I, foreign. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but, ha ha, funny, because, no, my family's been here a really long time. I think the first family member came over, I want to say 1640. Um, it, oh, actually, we didn't mention this initially, so we have a, a little extra bit of Good. info. Um, he stowed away. So Solid. Yeah, I'm an illegal immigrant. Nice. <laughs> you're, you're illegal. Anyways, we got over here in the 1640s, and uh, the family has had time in military service uh, for every single conflict. So I served in the current, and my uncle was in Vietnam. Um, my dad's dad was in World War II. My mom's dad was in Korea. And then we've had family in uh, World War I, the Spanish-American War, both sides of the Civil War. Uh, the Revolutionary War, the winning side, and then uh, also the French and Indian War. So we've had people serve all the way back through before it was the U.S., you know, before it was all the colonies. Right. Um, and it's it was a driving force in me being somebody that wanted to serve during conflict. Um, and it's also part of why I got out. Like, it wasn't something that we did forever. This wasn't right. a career move for me. Um, I enjoyed it, and I'm glad I did it. Um, and you know, some of the things that the family's been able to have historically are, are really cool. Um, like my, my dad's great grandfather on his mom's side, uh, was actually a prisoner in Andersonville in the civil war. And we know that because he survived and he ended up being, I think crippled the rest of his life afterwards because the place was a, a hell. Yeah. Right. Um, and we talked about this earlier, but like, if you haven't looked it up just you know hit pause for a second and go check out andersonville civil war it's shocking horrifying shocking like yeah the worst possible conditions like a shit ton of people died there purely out of neglect yep and so um great grandpa great 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 grandpa edgington he was actually a flag bearer so he carried a, a union flag um and when he was captured they they capture all that shit, and he yanked off one of the tassels from the flag, which is wild, you know, to think, like, he could probably could have been killed for that. Right. Like, why are you trying to keep part of this this thing that, you know, is literally an emblem of your opposition to us? Right. Well, he kept it, and we have a letter describing what that tassel is, and that tassel and a photograph of him and the letter are all framed in my parents' house. And it's incredible to have that piece of history it's 160 ish years old from an American flag that went through that prison camp that is in the home. Yeah, you, you sent me a picture of that oh, yeah. how long ago, and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> it's heavy. It's, it's, it's just a heavy. really heavy, uh, I don't even know how to describe it because when I saw it, I was like, holy shit. It's, yeah. That the, and the circumstances around Andersonville were so horrific. Just One, extreme. And then to have a piece of that history is truly incredible. And then, you know, dovetailing that with your your grandfather's mm. personal history, yeah. which is another horrific fucking piece I mean, of American history. That, that was another guy. I mean, his so his granddad fought in the Civil War. Um, and, uh, you know, he grew up during the Great Depression and World War II comes around and he was at Gonzaga. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, he probably should have played professional baseball. Like he was that good of a a ball player. Right. Um, He played with a bunch of the, so they used to do pickup baseball games overseas. Um, I I think they've done some like documentaries about that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. He played with those people. (laughs) Like he played pro baseball. Wow. 
in the war. Um, and they asked, like, oh, why aren't, you know, you should, you should come play. Um, and on my mom's side, actually, we had somebody play for the Reds. Like, so there is a lot of baseball in the family. Right. But instead, no, he was a Marine in the South Pacific in the 6th Marine Division, and he did seven combat landings, including two in Okinawa. Which is insane. Like, totally insane. It's completely insane. I just went back through those, or a couple of those books, Helmet for My Pillow, The Old Breed, and it had been several years. Yeah. And I think, for me, I have to have that azimuth adjustment, so to speak, to think about and talk, really talk about a re-zero. Re, it's it's re-zeroing your azimuth. What's yeah. important, <clears throat> you know? How bad do we really have it? You know, there's all these. Like, it's a psychological benefit to kind of go back through and read what those guys went through, specifically in the South Pacific, because talk about a fucking horrendous task and talk about the conditions of what they were fighting through and no incredible and no no preparation like no you know what was the nearest thing they had was probably guys that served under macarthur Mm -hmm. that ran from the philippines right might have been the closest they had to understanding what kind of conflict they were getting into maybe maybe yeah maybe maybe kind of they Maybe were just kinda. learning as they were going. Like yeah. you read stories from Guadalcanal, it's a damn nightmare. It's a it, and then talking to my granddad about Okinawa and and Tinian, and it's just like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, I know. I, I know. I know they did the South Pacific. I think HBO they did, did that. Yeah. They did that. It was called the South Pacific or the Pacific. I can't remember. I think it's what called, it was called the Pacific. The Pacific. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it. So I had read the books before. Yeah. The Ambrose books? Yeah. I don't know if they're Ambrose, but there's a couple different authors there. And I had read those books before, watched the Pacific, and I'm so glad they did it yeah. because so much of World War II is in the history of World War II has been enveloped with the European theater. Yeah. Uh, and like that's, lo- that's what people see in their heads. Like they yeah. close their eyes, they hear World War II, and they, they see like, you know, Dresden on fire yeah. or they see D Day, right? Yeah. Well, like, I mean, imagine like the landings at D-Day, but, you know, for two and a half, three years in a row. Right. Every island. Every island. Like, like, you know, hearing stories from my granddad about like, he remembers things like going up a beach and every single person around him, like on 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 a die face. Right. All dead. All dead. All dead. Going up the beach. There's no other way to get up there, you know, or... Or landing on a beach and they see a, a naked chicken walking around because he's got his feathers blown off right. by the bombing, right? It's just wild. And if, and, and like for me to tell him that I was going to go be a team guy, right? you know, he's like, oh, okay, yeah, that's, I mean, I guess if you want to be a squid, like whatever. <laughs> yeah. And I told him what I wanted to do and he's like, oh, okay. And he had a little yeah. bit of respect because he remembered seeing some of those UDT guys. Yeah. He remembered those Fucking crazy people. <laughs> yeah. Here's your knife and your swim mask. Good luck. Hope we see you later. Yeah. Here's uh, cover yourself in uh, grease. Uh, yeah. It's gonna protect you from you'll, the cold fucking water. You'll what? be okay. Wear yeah, these you, shorts. But <laughs> yeah. that kind of family background is, um, it's not hyper common, right? I know, especially yeah. now, like it, multiple, multiple, multiple generations. Um, you know, when you're talking like a couple centuries worth, right? So it's. It didn't feel like a duty, but it didn't not feel like a duty. Yeah, especially when you have that, that's a DNA connection to that. It's not, that point, yeah. yeah, it's a DNA, it's a hard connect into that yeah. reality. I think, I, I don't <clears throat> know how many times I thought about my grandfather. He was a, um, he was a radio guy on a B-24 Liberator <sighs> flying out of the Aleutians into Japanese territory, so he's... <sighs> He hated flying after, of course, Wouldn't of course you? he did, right? <laughs> so shot at me for three years. <laughs> yeah, and, and then hearing his stories, uh, it, it was, it growing up hearing his stories, yeah. because I would ask him and ask oh, him yeah. and ask him and ask him, and I remember so acutely listening to him talk about just dropping bombs on the Japanese, and he was part of the initial... Uh, invasion force in the Army Air Corps Army Corps mm-hmm. as they took back the section of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. A lot of people didn't realize that the Japanese had actually occupied a US, section US of soil. U.S. soil, yeah. which was you know 
obviously in the Aleutian Islands. I think it was like they lost like 3,500 troops. The it Japanese was, did. Yeah. So he was from start to finish, tip to toe on that thing. And, uh, and I remember really so well because he had a, uh, he had a bronze star on his keychain for as long as I knew him. he had his, he had one bronze star, but he, that was only one yeah. after he passed away. He had, you know, he had multiple awards to include, a, a, um, it's like the air cross and a bunch of other things mm-hmm. where you're, you're like, and then he had clippings of his, you know, his name in the local paper, That's you know, wild. hero returns to small town, like type shit. And it resonated with me so well because my grandfather was such a funny, funny, charismatic guy. You would never have known that you know, he had been through, you know, two years of just absolute fucking hell flying over like dark, like dark, cold, scary water. Just the weather conditions flying out of the Aleutian They're Islands were you. fucking scary as hell. Let alone going over Japanese occupied territory, dropping fucking loads of bombs, and then hoping that you're going to get back multiple articles. Or there's a series of books written about those guys, and their their airplanes were, would come back just fucking tattered from flak. Oh yeah. So I can't even imagine one. I don't like flying over dark, scary, cold water to begin with. Like I just don't appreciate it. It's not something I'm into. But then doing that every day is part of your job and hoping that you're going to get fucking back. Like flying on empty. My grandpa used to always tell me this, like we would be Glad sputtering <laughs> from fuel, running on fucking fumes, That's insane. trying to fucking land on a postage stamp island that they were having a hard time finding because of cloud cover and weather conditions. So you're just trying to find your way fucking home. Like. It, the amount of fortitude, the mental fortitude to God. continue doing it. Like I, I thought about that <sighs> before my first deployment, my granddad's like, Oh yeah, you know, keep your head down. And I'm just thinking like, I didn't, I didn't respond to him. <laughs> right. Like, you know, right. Cause like, I, how do I respond to that? Yeah. That dude got, and everybody around him got shot at for years, storming beaches over and over and over, like thinking, Oh, maybe this time it'll be different. Yeah. No, they weren't. It's this is gonna be just like last time. <laughs> it's not worse. Again, we're gonna do it again. Yeah, we're because because we're getting closer and closer to the Big Island. Yeah, it's gonna only the fighting's only gonna get more difficult. They're gonna get more pissed. Yeah, they're only gonna hold on to it even tighter. And it gets like being able to have that kind of connection is wild, right? Yeah, I would think about it all the time, especially knowing think about it all the time. Like for you, right, joining, and then now there's a war going on, and then like for me, like I joined mid-war. Mm-hmm. like I had a sort of kind of an idea like well I grew up listening to grandpa talk about this yeah like, this is like let's go be stupid yeah let's keep our fingers crossed and try not to get our head blown off or our heads blown off like I, I I I was explaining this to somebody I was like yeah you just kind of forfeit the idea that you're not going to live and it's interesting because Weird, reading about it's a weird thought process the world war ii veterans that were successful as well and the psychologically the, the the psychologically successful guys were always the guy that's guys that said i've already forfeited my my life i'm yeah. done just so assume I've, I'm, I, not. I'm just just assume you're not going to make it just, it I, makes everything a lot easier and it did it made it, everything a lot easier i remember so well crossing the berm into iraq going I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna come back from this. So I'm not even gonna start making plans past the age of fucking twenty five. Well, you're not being it's fatalistic. Not matter. You're not being fatalistic. You're just like, well, I'm yeah. just never gonna see thirty. Yeah, that's just, uh, just how it is. So every day after thirty, it's interesting. I've had to try to figure out my life after that because <laughs> like, I'm like, crap, uh, I'm still here. What am I gonna do now? <laughs> we'll <laughs> guess, see. Guess I'll try to figure it out. <laughs> we met in California at from, one of Dudley's from shop. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, John Dudley was a mutual uh-huh. friend, and then we all did this archery instructional. It was you, me, George Peterson. Yep. Um, Joe was there. Joe was Jocko there. Jocko was. We just went out that night. I with think. him, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So <clears throat> I'm trying to think of who else was there. Barklow was there. Barklow. That's. <laughs> God, man, it, that was such a good time because John's great. a great instructor. Oh man! And 
I was relatively new. I, I'm still new. I, I can't really classify myself as, uh, a, I would say, a proficient archer. Like I can hit. I don't know. Targets. We were doing great the other day. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 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 Lies. Uh, I well, <laughs> I, I I started with a traditional bow, and I really still enjoy They're shooting fun. a traditional bow. They're super fun. Yeah. You know, and you look cool. But like John says, if you want to hit what you're aiming at, <laughs> you might want to adjust your your Ooh. system to a compound. And that new PSE that he sent was, it's uh, it it's pretty incredible. So, you know, as we start to unravel even just our personal history and how we connected through yeah. John, really through archery, and then we went, we did a moose hunt together. Mm-hmm. Uh, God, that was when was that? I don't Last even know. Fall. Yeah, that's Last right. Fall. Last fall. And that moose hunt, we both took the same kind of route. We're like, we're driving our shit home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, you moved, that's right. You moved up to Utah. Uh-huh. You moved up to Utah and we were like both yeah. planning, like, what are we going to do with this moose? Yeah. And my only objective, cause I took this moose and it was, it's rack was just pathetic. <laughs> and it was, I don't know. It's gorgeous. It was <laughs> pathetic, but <laughs> it's delicious. Yes. So my only objective with going up there was I really, really wanted to feed my kids, my family moose. Yep. I really wanted to feed my family moose. I was not concerned with the size of the rack. I wasn't concerned with taking a trophy. I was only like, I want a legal, I'm not legal leaving animal. here. I'm not leaving here until like I have an animal. Yep. And you are you are the same way. You're like, oh, you yeah. know what? I'm I'm not leaving until <clears throat> I get an animal. And I mean, maybe people have seen that moose rack now uh when i was on joe's show right you know so some people have seen the size of that thing They're like oh yeah that's a cool huge trophy animal well i can be very honest that i actually tried to kill another moose earlier that day didn't get within range like mm-hmm. i just couldn't get a clean shot and he had smaller paddles than anything we killed mm-hmm. the, the, <laughs> the whole trip so believe me when i say i was up there for fucking meat like i was there meat hunting period i just got Really, 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 really lucky. With, yeah, I think, with that animal stepping out. Yeah, for sure. Because you don't know. Like you don't know. All you're hearing is like, oh, oh, oh. Like, you don't know. I don't know what's in there. Holy crap! He's gigantic. <laughs> yeah, can't Whereas, miss this. <laughs> like my experience. So the funny thing was, was I had been hunting for a few days with a different guide. Yep. Um, and I wasn't really that satisfied with the hunt that I was getting. Trevor killed his moose, and then it's like, hey, go with my guide. Turned into a totally different hunting experience. Yep. It was the first time I'd ever hunted with a guide, so I, I was unsure as it's, to it's kind a, of how to navigate that relationship. It's an interesting relationship, right? Yeah, it's a super interesting relationship. Yeah, um, and the guys that we had there were awesome. Like the, yeah. the the camp itself, like Andy Stomp, John Barclow, you know, you and mm-hmm. Dudley. And Dudley, for people that don't know, like. John is probably one of the 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 the, the, the most fun people oh to God. be around at hunting camp. It's out of control. It's out of <laughs> it's out of fucking control. It's so much fun. Yeah. Cuz his like you know, he puts the F in, in hunting. You know what I mean? Like I think, fun. I think the first bear camp I did with him, after that bear camp, I was like I'm never missing another hunting camp with you. Like if you if you invite me on a hunting camp, I'm going because this is absurd. Like, it's absurd in a way where you're it's it's dangerous fun. That's yeah. what I like about yeah. doing things with John. He could have his you know, he has had, had his, his own television series, but yeah. He truly enjoys a bit of dangerous fun. Yeah. And if you're out with him, like, you know, you you realize like you're going to put in some work. You're going to mm-hmm. put in a, a lot of work, I would imagine, because everything I've ever done with John, it's typically you're going to put in some th- some physical miles. Yeah. Uh, you're going to kill something for sure. Like oh, yeah. You're going to kill something. It doesn't matter. There's going to be blood on the ground. Mm-hmm. There's going to be blood on the ground. And you might be a little bit drunk a lot of the time, right? Uh, yeah. There there might a be A little, that. a lot. Yes. So, <clears throat> the, but John makes it a lot of fun. I mean, I think it, as when we look at like all the people and that we spend time with John is probably yeah. one of the, the most energized and fun people to be around because he so, just doesn't give and it's shit. genuine. Yes. Like that is his personality to a T. It's amazing. 
he's a gorilla one like yeah, he is like an orangutan maybe. he's like he's big yeah, and tall. he's a big like like a linebacker essentially he's yeah. built like a fucking linebacker well, he played he played ball right right like he could have been an he could have been an athlete for sure for sure for sure and you know i i remember the first time that i brought him out to the ranch down in texas and um he was up probably till three o'clock in the morning with JT and, and probably the, one of the few people that could put JT under the table. Well, JT. <laughs> and then there's another guy that's an MMA fighter that we hang out with up there, Jeremy. And those guys are no joke. They are professionals at pushing the limit. Yeah. And John not only hung, but probably exceeded expectation. Cause I was concerned. I was like, man, I, I hope I, I hope these these guys are going to be all right around John because you know I don't know if John's going to you know want to just get it on just hammer you know? down. No, no, he was like yeah. hammer down, and then he's up at six thirty or when whenever six thirty a.m. He went to bed maybe three hours before that, throwing around kettlebells. I remember that at my first bear camp, we're up there, and I'm like Andy, like I saw a lot of booze, and I'm like, hmm, okay. I, is he gonna hang? He's like, you watch out. Yeah, watch out. <laughs> you watch your ass. You be careful. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? I can't. I can't put in those type of miles, man. Like I, I'm not built for that I, type I, of speed. I did that as a new guy. I'm good. Yeah. Like he is. But it's great. He's like a what I would call him is he, he's like a tractor <clears throat> monster truck. Yeah. He's really fun, but there's a lot of utility that you can get done. <laughs> yeah, and you're probably not going to be able to flip it. No, no, nah, no. you can't flip no, it. Uh -uh. You're never going to see no. the wheels up. No, not happening. And it, you know, outside of the fact that he's probably one of the most proficient, you know, archers in the in the nation, as far as like his instruction, what he does, and this isn't a podcast just promoting John, but God, what a fucking cool guy that dude is. And I like seeing people like that that are so genuinely willing to give their time away yeah which he does he gives it away all the time like all if, the time. you gotta you guys don't know who john dudley is like school and knock if you're even interested in archery yep. which uh you know trevor and i obviously we we minor interest minor interest yeah <laughs> at this point i would say that i probably have a major <laughs> obsession <archery> problem <laughs> I have, yeah i may or may not be building arrows in my garage <laughs> all the time <laughs> all the time uh -oh. yeah uh, it, it's so much fun. And I think you and I have talked about it a lot where this active form of meditation, mm -hmm. how helpful it is. You know, I'll go out. I've got, you know, my bow literally is set up right outside. Oh yeah. And I'll go out and shoot 10, 15, 20 arrows, come back in, go back to work. It just gives me a little bit of a release and I then I can go back into what I was doing. I do that at the house too. And it's like, you know, those first three or four, you're still thinking about whatever was going on, but you know, by the time you've walked down to the target and come back two or three times, like, you know, you're 18 or 20 euros in, it's like nothing's bothering me. Nothing's bothering me. And I think that that's an interesting thing for, for veterans. Oh yeah. Where, you know, you've, you've done a ton of shooting in your past. Obviously, yeah. you know, Trevor was a seal if you didn't know that. So he's done a ton of, yeah, I cut my hair. So it's tough. To yeah. Tell now. It's, it's, and <laughs> you don't have a lot of gel in it. Yeah. Keep but down low. you've taught a ton of shooting. You've yeah. done it on the private sector as well. Mm -hmm. But what's, what's kind of give us some ideas and thoughts around archery and what it's done for you and kind of how did you get turned on to it? So what's, what's your background in it right now? Archery, I never had an interest in rifle hunting, mm -hmm. period. Um, and why? Part of that's because of how I grew up. So I grew right. up in LA. Mm -hmm. um, I'm literally from Los Angeles. Uh, my mom's from LA, my dad's from LA. Like there just isn't a background there. Now it wasn't an anti-gun or anti-hunting household. It's just, you know, I'm not going to walk into my backyard and see deer. Right. Like we, they were there. Right. But they're not, it's not part of the culture there. Um, now obviously it was for my grandparents, but it just wasn't taken forward. So mm -hmm. by the time I joined the Navy and then spent nine years as a team guy, you know, I'm like, I don't, I'm proficient enough with a rifle. Like that doesn't seem very entertaining to go shoot an animal with a rifle right when you know everything inside of 500 seems like a, a chip shot i'm like right. eh, i think i'm okay now i'm not denigrating anybody that's rifle hunting no period uh -uh. i just 
I know where my background was, so I didn't have any interest. Mm-hmm. I had done a lot of spearfishing out in Hawaii where I was stationed initially. So when Andy started getting into archery and bow hunting through John, right, I told him, like, hey, man, if something comes up, I want to learn how to do that because that's probably the only way I ever want to hunt anything. And, man, from step one, it just felt right. Like, shooting an arrow, I'm like, this is really hard. Like, this is like this is like pistol shooting but harder. Right. Like, way harder. Way harder. Like, everything you do wrong in pistol shooting, you have a minor little defect, you get a, a little miss. Everything you do wrong in archery, it's exacerbated to the point where you don't even know where the arrow went. Like, yeah. oh, that's great. That's gone. <laughs> Never going to find that. <laughs> it's insane. It, it's It's literally insane how much how much shit you have to put into that how much thought or no or no thinking to get a great archery shot off mm-hmm. so for me being somebody that's taught rifle and pistol combat shooting i was immediately drawn into how difficult it is knowing i'll never get this right perfectly and so from there from that first animal i took which was a black bear i was like this is the only way i want to hunt i love this and i just fell in love with the sport and how difficult it is and how much practice I have to put into it and how how fucking quiet it is too. Right. It's such a cool physical act. And it's a thing that humans have been doing for so long. It's part of our DNA. It really is. Yeah, we were talking about that the other day. <clears throat> oh, yeah, Because you were talking about it uh, 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 with Mark, right? Yeah. Was that a conversation you were having yeah. with Mark? Yeah, with Twy. Yeah. And so we were talking about how... Archery itself goes back, was it 13,000 years? Is that what you're saying? I think the oldest confirmed bow and arrow is from 11,000 years ago. And There's some guesses on older stuff, but they are absolutely positive that's what that thing is. Which in the frame of, you know, human development, it's a second, right? It's nothing. But it's still, when we look at all the rest of the components of, you know, humanity and uh, hunting and gathering and yeah. things like that. There is a very, uh, a, a somewhat of a spiritual component to it. Yeah. That I'm, I have a hard time putting my finger on necessarily. I just know for, from my perspective, I like to think of myself as more of a projectile enthusiast, right? Like I yeah. like to hit targets with anything. So if I'm like, you know, throwing my gum in the garbage or, you know, you know, rolling fucking, bowling yeah. balls or whatever it is like i want to hit targets i just enjoy hitting targets oh yeah pistols were always way more fun for me when i was working when i was one in the military and then as an instructor and working at the agency i loved shooting pistol one yeah. of the reasons i love shooting pistol was it was difficult it it's was very difficult so difficult right i mean especially when you compare the amount of proficiency that guys in our position you know, across the board have with rifle and pistol, right? Right. You basically teach any one of us monkeys how to shoot a rifle and you put enough around sound range and eventually it's just like, so I just put like the X thing on the thing I want to hit. It goes, goes away. Yeah. Yeah, That's how that works. Especially once you put nods on and a laser, it's almost like cheating. It's it's a video game. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, you can hold it. I point at it, right? You just, (laughs) Put the laser on the target and pull the trigger. Is that how this works? Yeah, that's how yeah. this works. Watch, do it again. <laughs> yeah, do it again. That one's gone too. Bing, bing. <laughs> you know, okay, well, I, I get this. As opposed to pistol where all it takes is the tiniest little misstep in your head. Right. Not even physically. And you're off paper. Off if paper. You're, if you're shooting at a paper target, which is almost numbingly frustrating. Very. Yeah. Being a competent, you know, pistol shooter puts you in a different category as a shooter as well. I know a ton of guys that are, I'm not taking anything away from the rifle because there are a ton of people out there that you and I both know that can throw rifles around. They are incredible at what they do. I love shooting a rifle, but if you, if you give me my choice between firearms that I want to shoot when I go to the range it's always going to be my pistol every time. Yeah. And I know exactly what pistol I'm going to take. I'm going to take an STI with, you know, an optic. If I've got the ability to put it on a suppressor, I'm going to because that's just the way that I like to shoot. Yeah. I like to shoot for time. I like to shoot moving. Uh, there's so many different things that you can put in that uh, I think create an element of fun, an additional layer yeah. of difficulty 
that it becomes way more entertaining for me. Well, like at the team, nobody ever says, oh yeah, that guy's like a killer rifle shot. It's no, it's, oh yeah, so-and-so can, they can do that like nine plate drill, like fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah. like, that's the dude you talk about, yeah, right? That's... Nobody gives a shit if you can, you know, put 30 rounds down range in a, in a tennis ball size target. They're like, that's neat. Everybody can Everybody do that. Everybody can do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, cool. Okay. And that was one of the things I was instructing throughout the years and then looking at archery, getting turned on to archery, the way that I was mm -hmm. turned on to it was I was looking for a way to shoot while I was roasting coffee or answering customer service emails while I was working. So my first target that I built was coffee bags, uh, big burlap sacks where yeah, green yeah. coffee comes yeah. in and I stuffed a burlap sack full of other burlap sacks because I had plenty of those and <laughs> got all sorts of this shit, <laughs> got all sorts of that shit. So I would go into the back uh, behind my office and shoot traditional bow, which uh, is quiet as shit. Quiet. Don't I need a lot of, don't need a lot of distance. <clears throat> 20 yards. Yeah. I, I could, I could have fun even at 15. So I could go back and get these reps in, shoot into a target, get my mind completely out of work and then come back refreshed thinking that i i had actually accomplished something which is really just a, a, a psychological game that i was playing with myself because i hadn't really accomplished anything other than hitting a target yeah with a projectile yeah but projectile enthusiast i was a little bit apprehensive about getting into compound and additional layers of technology mm -hmm. because it looked so confusing the whole thing looked yeah. really confusing to me. Yeah, it's a science project. It is. It looks ridiculous. It looks, it looks fucking ridiculous. And yeah. there are so many different components versus a traditional bow is just a piece of wood and a, and and a, string. a string and an arrow. Well, <laughs> shit, I can figure that out. Yeah, I can do this. <laughs> I can do this on my own. <laughs> yeah, I don't need, a, I don't need a, an instructor to teach me how to yeah. do this. I don't this need a guru. This is pretty easy. Uh, yeah. But it, it, it's way more complex. It oh, really yeah. is. Uh, it was a great way to learn because the other the other piece of that was as I started to in, in the first bow that that was given to me was given to me by Baker Levitt. So oh, he man. kept he kept trying and trying and trying. It's like you got to do this. You've got to do this. You've got to get a bow. You've got to get a bow. That guy is an advocate for stuff he loves. He. Whoop. Loves it. And I used to always make fun of him. I was like, why would I use a bow and arrow, dude? I have a rifle. Are I you could, stupid? I could kill something at yeah. you know a mile away, plug in my <laughs> dope. I'm gonna drop it in over a, a ridge line. Like, what are you crazy? <laughs> but once I, I once I was given the 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 Hoyt mm -hmm. from from him and the guys over at Hoyt were freaking awesome too. They brought me into the shop. They gave me a quick instructional on it. They, they're here in town, right? Yeah, they're right here, in, here in town. Salt it was Isaac, who now works for us. Actually, he worked for Easton, but yeah. he brought us in. Instantly, after throwing a couple arrows, I, I, I said to myself, okay, let's not get too into this. <laughs> let's try to dial uh, it back a little uh -oh. bit. It's going to be a money <laughs> suck. <laughs> but <clears throat> that's not the case. I mean, I have... Oh, man bow vices and uh, all kinds of crazy shit now yeah. that I never, I mean, there's, there's not like a five gallon bucket out there full of arrows. There is a five gallon bucket out there full of <laughs> arrows. There is. The, nice, the other nice thing is Easton's been so generous to the, to yeah. us as well because we oh, do yeah. a ton of giveaways and I can honestly say I haven't spent a lot of money on, on archery. Uh, so you've probably driven a lot of business. Yeah, but I, I think it's part of the charter of the company at this point yeah. to turn veterans onto archery. I really think that it's an incredible sport, and it, it, it does something for and you your sanity. You don't even need to be a guy that wants to connect with an animal. No. Mm -mm. At all. And it's so much more accessible because every town either has a place that is open enough and legal where you can just set up a target and go shoot it, or they have an archery club or a range that you can go shoot. I mean, even in Balboa Park in San Diego, that's where I was shooting, right? right? A lot. There are not that many places you can go shoot rifle and pistol. No. You know, and, you know, thank God that we have laws in the country that allow people to own as many firearms as they do, but they're still so restrictive 
for a good reason that it's not that accessible for so many people. So archery is something that you can literally do basically in your basement. Yeah. Right. You ain't, you ain't going down to your basement and shooting your 300 blackout, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you can, your, your neighbors it, might knock on the door. Yeah. You, you can, I, I wouldn't suggest that as a, no. as a course of action, Yeah, but practicing your draw, hitting a target, doing all the <clears throat> fundamentals of archery can be done in your basement. Guys do it all winter long. Yeah. They post videos about it all, all across the internet. All winter. Right. And, and Dudley has shown, and he sells a, a release like a, the right release. Yep. A basically dry fire system. Right. You don't even need a bow. Nope. You don't even need to be shooting a bow. And when I was traveling a bunch two years ago, right after he taught me, I had to take like two months off right. of archery because I was traveling a, a ton. Um, that's when I went to Lebanon doing some security work. Right. And I just took the right release with me. And the second I came back, it took like one session and I was right back on it. Yeah. It was, get your dry fires in. Get, get your reps in. Get your reps in. I, th- I think that's one of the 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 single best things I have started in the last I would say at least decade, where it it continues to evolve as a skill set that you can you can move into whatever rabbit hole and you can get as sophisticated yeah. as you want, or you can be the guy that you know throws fifty arrows a year. I was talking to a, yep. a super accomplished hunters about what do they do throughout the year? What are they doing to prepare for hunting season? And one of my buddies was like, oh, I go out and I shoot like 50 arrows. The rest of the time he's shed hunting and he's out in the mountains, but he doesn't really shoot a lot. He just makes sure that his bow's tuned, it's dialed. And so when he goes out, he's ready to connect. And 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 he kills an elk every year. And those are guys that are putting themselves, like they're mitigating that, you can call it lack of practice in comparison by volume, right? By putting themselves in scenarios and knowing the terrain and just being a better hunter, right? Right. And like for us, coming from that background, we're trying to mitigate all the factors, right? Like, I want to be a very good hunter as well as I just want to be comfortable with a shot at 60, right? But take a shot at 15. Yeah. Like, that's what I want, right? That well, That's where I want to be. Gosh, we've, we've actually <clears throat> done more hunting than I, I was I was trying to think about it because Hogs. we went and did a hog hunt in Oklahoma mm-hmm. with John oh, another yeah. so I drove up from San Antonio and met uh Barklow. Yep. Was Barklow there? Barklow was there. Yeah I think Barklow the was there. Torsten was there. Torsten. Andy was Andy. there. Andy <clears throat> and was fun. <laughs> that was so much fun. Oh, man. Oh, gosh we put in probably fifty miles. There was a lot of walking. There was a lot there of was walking. A lot of walking. <laughs> <laughs> before <laughs> I got an arrow off yeah. into my first hog, I put in, because I was looking at my step counter on mm-hmm. my watch, I put in easily 50 miles before I connected. I think we were all saying like, ah, back again today, another 15 yeah, another, in the bank. We, Shit. <laughs> yeah, we were putting in 12 miles a day. Yeah, that's I remember what I mean. very specific. Was I was absurd. putting in 12 miles Ugh. a day. And it was frustrating enough that you you just wanted to kill you just wanted to kill a hog. Yeah. By the way, the the myth of uh, wild pigs not tasting very good that's that's a that's a myth. Total that's horseshit. that's a total horseshit. Yeah. Myth. I would imagine there are some based on I guess based on size they yeah. can and based on maybe time of year and what they're eating. I'm not exactly sure. I, but I when like we ate it in Oklahoma, it's great. It was amazing. Chad was cooking. Yeah. Well. It helps when you have the guy from Trigger cooking. I this, this is like <laughs> this is like the worst podcast. Like, oh yeah, you guys just like shoot arrows with John Dudley, and they got a Trigger, <laughs> the chef from Trigger. Should just skip that one myself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how lucky are we at this point in our lives where the guy from Trigger comes out and cooks? But that was incredible. And I yeah. think actually John had cooked that. I don't know if that the first was Chad. Night. Yeah, the first night. Yeah. Because I think it was the second night or so that um, he and Preston were cooking. Right. Yeah. yeah. And we had we had a blast on that trip as well. Super because fun. We we did some long range shooting. Oh, we, yeah. we they were they were like because Andy at that time was still getting the pretty dialed with long range yeah. shooting. Yeah. Um, Andy's a relatively good and experienced uh, proficient LR sure. guy. Yeah. So 
they both had the same setup, so it made it really easy mm-hmm. for him to sit there and like teach him how. On a, I think it was a six five, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they were shooting the six five. I forget what it was, but, um, yeah. but damn, they were shooting a long ways. It was for, eight for dud. I mean, it was, it was over a grand. I think they were doing some it? over granders. Yeah. Well, they were definitely because they they did that. They did the hunting down in uh, next to the the, the Mexican border. Mm-hmm. So they went out to West's place. Yeah. They were shooting well over a grand out a there. Long ways. They were shooting a long ways out there. And I think that's one of the cool things with John is yeah. he's gotten turned on to shooting through yeah. us. We've it's been fun to teach him. It's been awesome. I, I put it I put a an STI in his hand out in Texas. I was like, all right, and it, it was uh John Dudley and Brett Burns and all these guys were yeah. out there. It's such fucking cool, cool group of people. You almost pinch yourself because yeah. you're around this such fucking really rad people. And John just picks up an STI, I gave him like maybe high point 20 minutes worth of instruction Mm -hmm. he's never shot a pistol to any level whatsoever he said ah maybe shot it at 30 minutes in my life maybe like everybody's handled one yeah he was ringing steel out to like 40 with it's a long way no problem whatsoever (laughs) now part of that is great gear yeah obviously you get set up with great gear great optics and, and archery is, very, is similar-ish. Yeah. Archery is similar-ish to pistol shooting. Like He, under, he understands yeah. that every minor error is a major conclusion on the back end. Like The second order issue that's going to go on when you, you know, squeeze too hard with one hand yep. or when you jerk the trigger, he understands it's the same as when he's shooting a bow and he's you know, squeezing the bow hand or yanking his release. Right. He understood that. Well, and and that's an interesting translation for most shooters. I think that shooting archery directly translates into the rest of your shooting. Oh, yeah. Because of that, and John proved that point to me, because he's Olympic-level archer, was. He shot probably hundreds of thousands of arrows, and he picked up a pistol. He would be categorized as in in a top— 10% 10% of all pistol shooters in the nation easily just based on what he was he was doing out there. He was shooting yeah. six-inch pie plates at 40 yards and ringing them 95% of the time. And he has said similar things because I've heard him say it offhand and then I've talked to him about it also, about guys coming from the special operations community mm-hmm. with the proficiency in shooting rifle and pistol that he puts a bow in our hands and he's like... Well, that's easy. That's fucking turnkey. <laughs> like that's that's ridiculous. Like you shouldn't just be able to hit a target at X distance, you right. know, with that kind of proficiency. But that's coming from a background of the exact same type of thing. Like, oh, look, bing, oh, it's on. Oh, that's neat. Oh, there there it goes. And I think that that's that's one of those things where if you're shooting now, you're thinking about shooting archery. The school in Ock obviously is the first place yep. you should go. That's uh, exactly where I direct people. I, I, I've told, I literally told two people earlier today, you need to go to school and knock because I, we bought PSE bows and give them to, uh, employees of the company. So they're getting their bows. People are getting their bows in the company. Matt and I both have PSE bows. We both shoot quite a bit. He's got, I don't know how many 3d targets in his backyard. When looks, I go it looks to like a, house, looks like a zoo when he shows it. I, seriously, <laughs> when I when I go to Matt's house, I always bring my bow, and he's always because he's a hyper competitive person as well. No, oh, you don't say. <laughs> and the first thing we do is the oh, first yeah. thing we do is let's let's go out and I mean uh, shit. What happened throw, on throw sa- together a competition? What happened on Saturday with just like our trad bows? Like, yeah. oh, this is fun at ten. How about we just like try like thirty five or something? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what, like, do you, what, do you, what do you think okay okay this is like the, this is when you know you have good friends <laughs> just so you, you guys know like to give context to what we did over the weekend so when, when you have good friends and you can call them i called trevor or texted him whenever it was i forget i was like hey tomorrow why don't we just bust out a quick workout maybe jump in a, a horse trough full of ice and do a few minutes in that we'll just kind of put together something because we're yeah. doing social isolation or social distancing because of the, the pandemic, but we can still spend time with one another. We're just, yeah. you know, three to six feet apart. We're, you know, not sharing food, blah, blah, blah. But Trevor's like, yeah, okay. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. So, Hey, <laughs> we'll just pick up, 
10 bags of ice on your way in, will you? And I don't even know. Oh. Did you even know what I was talking about when no. I, you were just, I, I, no was like, I was like, okay. Hey man, grab Whatever. some ice on the way in. You're like, I guess. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this thing is a horse trough. I think it's 250 gallons, give or take at the top. And I've got it out back. Yeah. I, I, I bought it because <laughs> I, was, I was, okay, we're going to be spending yeah. a lot of time here. My entire company probably thinks I'm crazy at this point because I'm walking around in my my swim trunks and dunking myself in ice. I had a couple of people be like, "What the fuck are you two doing over the weekend?" <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what what are, you, what are you guys doing? What's wrong with you weirdos? But you didn't you Trevor didn't even hesitate. He was just like, "Yeah, sounds good, man." So we did <laughs> was it 100 burpees for time. For time, and then we did 5 minutes a piece. Wait, more context. So Yeah. It was 43 degrees outside and, ra- yeah, and okay. raining. Yeah, and raining. And raining. Yeah. A little. So we went to the coffee shop. We made some <laughs> we made some hot hot beverages. Some tea, actually. It was just tea. Yeah, it was just yeah. tea. And uh Trevor, of course, he was the first in the shoot because he was 20 burpees ahead of me. And so I was filming him getting in and and then I jump in. So he technically warmed it up a little bit. You a warmed little. it up a little yeah. bit for me. And spilled some of the ice out. Yeah, you spilled we'll a little bit. We'll reverse it next time. So I, I have to go first next time. I came in the day before yesterday and did it again. I saw that. I was, um, I, was I did 10 you know. minutes. I how, did 10 minutes last time. How was that? Uh, my little, my feet were numb. A little chilly? Yeah, my feet yeah, were numb. Yeah. yeah, my feet were numb. I had to, you know, because we were sitting Indian style in this yeah. horse trough, <clears> which keeps your legs and your lower extremities a little bit a little warmer. Better. But I had to move my legs around in the water because my feet were numb. It starts to ache, right? Yeah, it starts yeah. to hurt a little bit. I remember that in the STV, like, um, you know, doing, like, you start getting into the multi hour, multi, multi hour yeah. dives, you know, eight, nine, 10 hours underwater, and like, I'm kicking my feet so I don't freeze to death. Because <laughs> <laughs> I can't uh, go anywhere. Yeah. Oh, this like, is fun. Super fun. But like I said, when I got in the horse trough, I'm like, ah, oh, I, I think my body's remembering how to do this. Because I wasn't, yeah. like, I, did, I don't know, I don't think I looked very uncomfortable. No, you didn't look uncomfortable whatsoever. Yeah. You just looked like you were sitting in a tub of water. It uh, is. It's a little chilly. It was chilly. I did When I did it the <laughs> other day. It, Ten, the, tens a little extra. When I did it the other day, though, the sun was out. Mm. And so. It makes a big difference. It makes a huge difference. Oh. Because my head was was warm mm-hmm. from and the sun was directly on my face, so so maybe we need like a pop tent over the top of it to avoid that. You know what I did is I started <clears throat> dunking my head uh, to get uh, one. It was to get the wet what, again. Is it a mammalian mammalian response? I believe mammalian yeah. mammalian, mm-hmm. um, which was an Aubrey Marcus, uh, which was something I learned from from listening to his podcast and talking to him. But I would dunk my head underwater to start cooling myself off even more because it, as if it wasn't difficult enough, <laughs> I felt like I was cheating because it was so warm. This you isn't know, fair to me. Like, this isn't fair. I'm not giving myself a full <laughs> experience. I need to give myself a better experience yeah. in this. Uh, so what I found is that works exceedingly well mm-hmm. because it fucking sucks. Yeah. You don't want to do it. No. But that forced compliance of it, making sure that you're getting a total experience out of something that is quite literally supposed to be a little bit miserable. It's supposed to suck. It's supposed to suck. Yeah. Now, the health benefits, I think, way outweigh oh, yeah. what, what the suck factor is. Um, but I wasn't going to go out and try to, try to shortchange myself. Now, I didn't get a good workout in that day at whatsoever. Because what I was going to do is do that first mm-hmm. and then sit in the sauna for a while, and the dry sauna, crank up the heat. But I couldn't get warm enough, even work trying to work out to try to get warm enough. So I kind of <laughs> cut my my workout <laughs> out a little bit. Mike Clancy, he's a he's a uh, former Force Recon guy. He's he's uh, he's working with us and he was out back and I was sitting there talking to him. It's like, so you're going to work out or what? And it's like, yeah. I don't know. I don't Maybe like I don't like it. I, I, it's, <laughs> you know, but it's those experiences. I think. See, but it's it's that kind of experience and those kinds of friends that are cool to have around. And it's like 
Like that moose hunt was like that, right? Yeah. <clears throat> but it snowed the first day. Yep. And it rained the next two. Mm-hmm. You know, like we weren't walking into animals and no. boun- bouncing into moose. Like it's, you know, or like that hog hunt. Like it yeah. was, it was fucking cold on that hog hunt. Like, it was cold. It was cold. Yeah. It was a lot, a lot of walk. Like I was glad to be walking because it was cold. I, I just like the, 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 the gear aspects of those things too, because when we first started on that hog hunt, mm-hmm. you and I both were in the same position where we were carrying our bows yeah. in our hands. And then after about day two, we're like, well, I'm just going to put this on my back. <laughs> yeah. On my back. <laughs> <laughs> it goes right this to the back. This is ridiculous. <laughs> this is, if we see hogs, we're a long way <laughs> off. So we're going to have plenty of time to do this. Oh, yeah. I remember though, because I was going out on the first, the first time and I was like trying to knock an arrow and yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. you're not going to need that for ready. a while. You're, you're not going to need that. That's cute, Evan. Yeah. We're good. We'll see one at lunch. But even going back to my moose hunt. So I, I walked and hunted for eight, eight days mm-hmm. and we only had 10 days out there. Yeah. So, which is part of why I shot mine on the fourth day. Yeah. Like, you're like, I'm Oh going. God, got to kill him. Well, he was massive either way. That right? so, I think you guys might've killed me. If yeah, if you would have passed that up, I would have been com- <laughs> really mortified. You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> and but I I had walked all week. Yeah. And that morning I had put in a few miles and we had we were we were on bowls, maybe one mm-hmm. or two. We we're calling him in on a lake. It was fucking beautiful morning breaking frost off off the top of the the grass and the high grass it's cool going up and over logs and getting down close to the water it was perfect moose droppings everywhere so much moose sign the ground still steaming from the beds that we're walking down through and we're going fuck if we don't kill something here we're completely fucked we are inept so sure thing one hits we're calling it in, and then we hear boom, boom, boom from across the lake. <laughs> and, oh man, I thought it was one of you guys. Yeah. So I thought it was one of one of us. So I was like, oh, that's great, man. Like somebody got somebody, one. El- somebody else got one. Not a big deal. But it wasn't one of us. So it was yeah. somebody else. So we're driving in, super defeated. My feet are frozen. So from me right. down yeah you said like your entire lower leg just numb just numb and it didn't matter I, we were blasting the heater into my feet my feet were completely numb and we're almost in, back in the sidetrack with no floor <laughs> yeah exactly no floor we're almost back to where we we're getting on the boats there's a moose standing in the middle of the road and broadside <laughs> broadside 98 yards broadside standing in the road and uh, Ashley's like, so this is how it goes. Ashley's like, do you want it? I was like, I, he didn't even have, he didn't get, do you want it out of his mouth? And I was, I, you can't, you can't hunt up there with a round in the chamber. So I was yeah. chambering around and the, the magazine that I brought with me that morning was not built for that rifle. So it didn't scrape around off. And then it's a 300 wind mag. So I pull up, click like, Hard click, no boom, fuck. And this thing just looked at me even more, just sat there and looked at me. How dare you? How dare you? What are you doing? (laughs) Give me enough time to chamber around. And boom, uh, double lung, a couple inches above the heart. Great. I mean, it's 98 shots. There are 98 98 yards. It, It was a chip shot. Yeah, you can't miss him. You can't miss. So I take off sprinting down the road to try because he to walked up. off. Yeah. He had it for a follow up <clears throat> shot. And he walked maybe 30 yards and I'm sprinting. Well, I pulled my my lower extremities were frozen. I pulled both my calves, like pulled them. Like not just a little bit, but completely. I, I felt like I severed the calf off my fucking bone in my leg. I remember this that night. Cause yeah, because I couldn't came walk. Back and you came back and you you were like, it was as if you had like air braces on both feet. Seriously. Like, what is wrong with you? Yeah. I pulled my calves. What? Double calf How do you do pull. both? <laughs> because I was wearing, 
fucking mountain boots that were frozen solid. Yes. Sprinting down the road. I went from riding in, in a in a tiny, because Caleb was in the back and he's oh, huge. So I couldn't recline the seat yeah. or get any more distance. So I'm crunched in there. I've got zero circulation. My legs are frozen. I'm jumping out to get a follow-on shot. I pulled Let's both my him. fucking calves. It's horrible. But then I walked down 30 yards and he was just Smoked. done. Yeah, he was done. Grizzly shit They're not everywhere. Super tough. Huh? They're not super tough. D- not with 300 Win Mag hole in them, right? I mean, m- not much is. Right? No, no, not with a big hole. But I, I will say, as, as experiences <clears throat> go in hunting, yeah. uh, and I've hunted a, a little bit in my life, but killing a moose was. So cool. So it is so cool. Well, and I remember that, like, you came back and the, we, well, we put him on a flatbed and left him over. Yeah. And then we mm-hmm. brought him all back. And, like, at that point, I think mine was starting to get to the point where it was, like, almost all quartered and skinned. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was starting to break mine down. And, like, that was so cool to have a couple moose in camp. And you were so freaking stoked to have, like, the, the organs and the heart and, breaking it down like i could see how how much you cared about that experience too like this is so cool so cool because it is i mean it their is. heart's the size of a volleyball it, yeah you're holding this heart out and it is it's the size of a fucking volleyball it's ridiculous you, trevor processed his entire animal so he was out there with knives and a sharpener and a vacuum sealer for I, what seems like a week. <laughs> yeah, it was like two, <laughs> two and a half days. Yeah. Two and a half days. <laughs> Don't want to do that again. <laughs> Not by it, myself. Whereas I just quartered mine, threw it into the back <laughs> of the truck. My dad came up. My dad came up and, and we met him and we just loaded this thing up in the back of his truck and drove it back down. Now, granted, I did have the time. I had sure. like four or four and a half days left of the hunt. I knew I was going to have the time to process it. And... Uh, I did go against everybody's advice. You did. Everybody said, you don't want to do that. Right. Yeah. And I did it anyway. You did it anyway, which <laughs> my hat's off to you because that was a ton of work. It was a shit ton of work. But yeah. I mean, it's paid off in the end because in December I shot an elk. Yep. And she was big. It was mm-hmm. like a depredation tag, so it was a, yep. a cow. And I, after that moose experience and having done a bunch of whitetail, I was like, cool, let's gut her and throw her in my truck. Yeah. Hole. Brought it home, laid her out in my garage, and I processed that whole elk in an afternoon. Wow, that's well, and that and that because that's the I thing. did the other thing. Yeah, well, yeah. and I did that even down in Texas a few months ago. Uh, Matt and I went out and went whitetail hunting, so we hunted yeah. whitetail together, <laughs> and then Matt and I went out like a week or so later, whenever this, whenever the season was, and uh, we processed one literally in an evening. So yeah. he and I zipped through that thing with zero we we had shot it had it on the ground and processed it and put all the meat basically in bags and it was done by 10 o'clock at night we were in and out we were drinking by 10 yeah it was fucking it really wasn't a big deal because it's a small animal oh yeah you're essentially processing something that's the size of a dog uh, which pretty much yeah it wasn't very big yeah but that entire week by the the meat that I had taken from our hunt together, which was the white tail down mm-hmm. on, the, on the border, and then that that white tail. By the time I put that other one in the processor to make sausage out of it, man, I was eating white tail for two weeks straight. And it's a great feeling to <sighs> be that self sufficient on red meat on protein, yeah. right? And especially something that you've handled all of it. You know, like it feels good to feed people that come to my house or to like I stayed at a friend's place on the way through Missoula on the way back from Canada Mm -hmm. after shooting that moose. And it felt good to hand him a piece of meat that I know I had processed. Right. You know, that came from an animal that I know how it died. And I was the one that was respecting that thing's entire existence. Right. And for me, it all started from that first hunt. And it's part of the archery thing. It's part of the whole hunting experience that's been so fulfilling is you're learning partaking and then passing on a skill that's been going on with humans person to person it's a physical thing you have to show somebody how to do it right for hundreds of millennia yeah hundreds of them. yeah hundreds of thousands of millennia right right so 
for all of human history, there's been some man or woman teaching some other boy or girl how to hunt and kill and process and cook in that order. And we're learning that from those successful members of those societies. And it's a very, very cool thing. Well, I I think that's what, when we first started talking about FRA and and a lot of people, they might not know the full history of FRA. And it was originally uh, John Dudley, Andy Stump. Uh, you were a big part of that as well. So, you know, we bought it from Andy and John, Mm -hmm. uh, last year we rolled it into black rifle coffee. One of the, the whole things that we want to accomplish here is, is this sharing of skill sets, Yeah. right? So how do we share good information and really essentially build a a collective of people that are interested in these same things that we are? Give people a resource. Yeah. You you brought over elk at Christmas, remember? Yeah. We had we had elk. I elk, think my wife had elk cooked jalapeno moose. poppers. Yeah, yeah. So there's no better feeling at this point. I, when I go down to the ranch, I eat, you know, whitetail that we've taken off the mm-hmm. off off the ranch, or axis that we've taken off the ranch. We're building garden beds down there. One yep. of the things that we're doing for the company. I'm doing that in the back of my house here soon. Yeah, we're doing it <clears throat> for the company is shoot, how do we build a garden and how do I build a garden that we can deliver, yeah. you know, a bag of groceries every week to everybody that lives in the San Antonio area, our, our employees. Yeah. I mean, that could be done here. Like there yeah. could be a quarter acre plot here yep. that is super self-sustaining, mm-hmm. just a greenhouse that runs year round. It's so easy. And I actually saw somebody uh, post something on, it was Instagram, like a social media platform today talking about victory gardens during yeah. World, War, World War II. Right. right? So they encourage people to have gardens and that delivered like 40% of all the groceries, yeah. vegetable groceries in the U S during that time. Cause they needed the other food from the major agricultural centers to go to troops and logistics overseas. So that kind of sustainability for communities is something that we're seeing the ramifications of that not being a thing right now. Right. Shortages where there shouldn't be shortages of some stuff. Right. You know, you, sh- you there, there will be shortages when people panic. There will be, period. But you shouldn't go to the store and be like, oh, cool, I can't buy a vegetable at all. No. Or meat at all. Like, that's ridiculous. Right. Right. And that's that's not the fault of the grocers. That's not the fault of the agricultural system. No, I, I think there's, there's something to be said about that for hunting in general and what that, that skill itself provides for mm-hmm. individual confidence and psychology. I want to be as self-reliant as possible. Yeah. One of the things that we're trying to do with the company is make it zero carbon emissions, not because, you know, I, because of some, you know, progressive wing nut. That yeah, some, some left it, sideways. It's because I, I, I don't want the interference. Yeah. I, I want to be able to power the company just on its own without talking to the city. And obviously yeah. you have to, but... <clears throat> this entire idea of self-reliance, I think, has to be activated again and injected into society. Absolutely. I hope this is one of the second and third order effects of the pandemic is that people don't look at prepping as some weirdo tinfoil hat thing that they're doing. It should be, this is my life. This is yeah. the way that I choose to lifestyle. live it. It's a lifestyle. And we talked about this over the weekend where it's like that that second, third order effect of being a hunter or somebody that has a garden or a friend has a garden. I mean, I know like in Switzerland, they do gardens where you just grow carrots, right? Your neighbor grows turnips, right? So you're maximizing the efficiency of the growing operation Mm because you're going to have some fail crops, right? Right. But you can trade amongst the community. Right. So, you know, if you're a hunter and you have some, some veggies in the background, you know, in your backyard, then this, that second, third order effect is I don't have to deal with, like, I've been asked a couple of times by some people like, oh, how has this whole thing, you know, really affected you? And I'm in a fortunate position with the company with how I work, right, that I've been able to, like, stay home. But mm-hmm. because I have so much meat at home and other stuff, and I I don't have to go to the grocery store. No. Like, like this hasn't affected me in that devastating way that it has for a lot of people, and I feel for them, but there is a way out of it on the back end. Yeah. And and a lot of people are, are, they'll say, well, and I've heard this too. It's like, well, that's easy for you to say because 
uh, you know, you guys are, you know, successful. I'm like, well, that's still taking a lot of work to get to this point. And yeah, it didn't my, just happen. My dad was you know, just a blue collar, single yeah. parent. He wasn't wealthy. My grand, my grandparents on both sides, they weren't wealthy whatsoever. They were actually yeah. classification would be poor. I mean, I we've talked about this. Both my grand, both sets of my grandparents came from depression farms. Right. Right. Like, I mean, my mom's dad co-opted his way through school. Yeah. He worked for the fucking college. Right. Like, come on, people. Like, it, it's all doable, right? It's all doable. And I think if people broke down some of the stigmas that are associated with it and said, you don't have to have a, a $10,000 rifle or no. a $5,000 bow. You don't have to have you know hundreds of thousands of dollars in a farming equipment to have a garden it it can't be overtaken by i i guess this progressive ideal uh, and the ideologues that say if you have a garden if you do these things you're some fucking crazy hippie mm-hmm. having the ability to feed your family and if you're just single if you're feeding yourself like there is such a unique subset of skills yeah. within that that are so interesting that you can choose to 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 turn off fucking football on sunday or whatever it is that you're into to go garden to go figure out how to grow yeah. kale <clears throat> or tomatoes and then figure out another layer of that maybe learn how to can yeah holy P- or shit pickle. or pickle yep or get a smoker and learn how to smoke your own fucking meats there are so many different things that you can do that are economical that actually save you money in the long run and we talked about this like I've had people say, now, granted, I'm in a great position where I have been able to save some uh, cash and be able to put down on some of these more expensive hunts. Right. But we've talked about this. Like, you know, an expensive hunt isn't that expensive when you look at how much meat you're pulling from the animal. Right. Right. Like those, you know, that moose, like I'm spending on less on the moose meat per pound than I would if I went to the store and bought ground beef, like good ground beef. Grass fed. Like, yeah, grass fed, finished with corn. And it's better. It's way better. It's way better. It's like, better for you. Like that's an older animal. It's put all that life into that meat. You know, like that's the reason chicken doesn't really taste like much when you get it from the standard, oh, the, that chicken costs $2 for the entire chicken, right? Because they grow them so fast to get them to a certain size. You know, you're not getting everything, the benefit out of that that you would out of like a, a couple year old gobbler that you shoot. Yeah. That's a turkey, right? right? A wild turkey. It's a different animal. It's a different animal. It's it's got a totally different when we look at even the DNA and how it's shifted, mm-hmm. how it's been modified. <clears throat> I think there's there's so many different things that we're going to get into over the next, you know, 12 and 24 months when we yeah. look at, you know, how we're looking at self-sustainment, how we're looking at self-reliance. It's not, you know, the tin foil hat stuff. It's a yeah. how do we how do we just make a really good you know, high value uh, vegetable garden. What's, yeah. what's high value mean? It means that you have to have a lot of macro micronutrients mm-hmm. within your garden. So how do you plot that out? How are you planting? How are you watering? How are you going about your daily lives? And like, does that mean like for, for us, like I want to put a garden and maybe have chickens in the back, right? right? With the garden to help pull the bugs away so I don't have to use pesticides you know like there are ways to go about some of this where instead of like you're not a prepper and you're not like a crazy hippie but when something weird happens you can go oh okay i'm good good." my wife and i've had chickens are i mean for years we've had chickens in the backyard we've always had a garden uh that's just us that's the way that we live my parents had a garden when i was growing up like we had pumpkins and squash and corn yeah we did on a tiny little like Tiny in LA. In LA. Well, we live downtown Salt Lake. Yeah. Right next to the the largest homeless population in the city. We had a, a fairly decent sized backyard, but mm-hmm. the, the house we lived in wasn't fancy. The house we live in right now is nothing fancy. We have a tiny backyard. We still have garden beds. We still yeah. grow simple things. Kale is one of those things that's so hardy, so easy to grow, and it's packed with all these nutrients. It's, a, it's an incredible plant. Yeah. But. <clears throat> We've done that every year where we can go out, we can pull the vegetables off our own garden, we can create a salad, 
we've had eggs in our kitchen for years that are coming from our chickens, unless our dog has eaten them and then we have to replace them. But, you know, according to us, they run away because yeah. that's, we, we have two little girls <laughs> that would be the very chickens were, disappointed the ch- the if, chickens they flew away. That, <laughs> if they knew that Dr. Beans was eating all the chickens. <laughs> uh Uh-oh. But we've, we've had, we've had a great time with it. The other thing with that is, my kids really get into it. Yeah. My kids love it. Well, and and the effect of that, as well as just raising, like very very simple animal husbandry, right, also puts you in touch with the food you're eating, and life and death, right? Yeah. So many people have a disconnected relationship, and that's part of why, I think that's part of why there's such a panic during they this don't know. pandemic. Is they're like, oh my god, what the fuck's gonna happen? You know, oh god, oh, there's people dying. Like, what is dying? Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know they. Most people, especially in the Western world, in a you know first world country, they take grandma and grandpa, and when they're too old for you to deal with, and by I mean deal with, is you know go to their house and they're there. You know when they're too old for them to have their own house, you just like send them to a home and then they die at some point. Right, right. Nobody deals with this. And, you know those hunter gatherer peoples, they they have grandma live with them or grandpa live with them until they die, and then they die in the house, and then you help them take them. The person out of the house and bury them right. right there's a close relationship with life and death that only in the last couple hundred years have people really distanced themselves away from well, and having animals like oh we have to i want to have a rabbit for dinner tomorrow cool well, that means you have to go outside and pick one right that is ready and kill it you know that's for me like i haven't bought red meat in a couple of years at a store and for part of that was i don't want to be part of the the whole factory farming system. Mm-hmm. I wanted to learn how to hunt, but I also wanted to have a relationship with the food I was eating. Right. You know, if I'm going to be the person eating that protein, be it rabbit, chicken, duck, turkey, moose, I want to be the one that killed it. I'm I'm going to put the work in. Right. You know, it put the work in growing. I'm going to put the work in processing it. Well, I think it's so interesting for me because when I look at these <clears throat> things, I just find them interesting because there's skills that you have to learn. You have to curate them over time. Yeah. There is no instant gratification in learning how to hunt. That's not a thing. No. You have to learn how to shoot and be proficient at shooting, especially whether it's archery. a firearm or archery. You have to learn the ins and outs of not only shooting a, a, a bow, mm-hmm. but then also you have the entire art of hunting on top of that, which is a, a, an, a, a lifelong, a skill. wide variety of skills and sub skills that you have to curate it's not just going out and you know hitting something over the head with a fucking hammer it's not easy but what i've told people i don't know in how long it's like nothing in life is worth having if it's fucking easy because you can't appreciate it as much as if you were to put in the work for it i've never had anything in my life that was just given to me where i've just appreciated Mm -hmm. what whatever it is So if you have to put in the work for it, if you have to walk the miles, if you have to actually learn the skills. So for me, gardening and hunting and those types of things, those are just interesting to me. I want to understand not only where my food comes from. And they're accessible. They're completely accessible. Especially, especially at the time we live now. Because if anybody out there is listening and hears, oh, garden X, Y, Z, and you're living in Brooklyn in an apartment, I want you to pause this get on the google machine right. and go apartment garden <laughs> yeah and you're gonna fucking find one where you can hang it up on a wall like right. you could live in a 400 square foot little place a 200 square foot place and have a hanging garden mm-hmm. like it My- is the tech is out there it is now the time is now to go backwards in your skill sets to learn those things to be self-sufficient in a tiny little space if that's where you're stuck if that's hey. where you're at and that's what your choice is you can do it and you and you you don't have the option anymore. You can't go to a concert. You can't go to bars. You can't go and do some of these things. Yeah. So order a garden. Order order a garden. Order something and start learning a new skill. Like like herbs. Those are so easy. <laughs> They're or, or super easy. Herbs are easy. Or or a hanging tomato garden. Yeah. So stupid simple. They grow themselves. Just put water in it. If you can not burn rice, you can have a garden. Yeah, and that, that's that's a whole other thing where it's it's when you look at living with the economy and how it shifts, mm-hmm. right? So 
high point if we looked at the economy three months ago and we said that was a high point of the economy and quite literally in the last, the last decade. decade plus. Yeah. You are living a very, um, a, a very removed from from the economy. You're 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 living a very removed and disconnected life because you could you could afford it, right? Yeah. You could afford to do those things. Now, because the forced social distancing, this the forced quarantine, what's going on with the the pandemic itself, what's going on with the economy, everything's tightening up. Mm -hmm. So now, as we tighten, I think people have to adapt their lives to that yeah. tightening. They have to say. What are the skills that I'm going to need to curate in order to make myself a little bit more self-sufficient, in yeah. order to, so to just create the positive psychology that you'll need in order to navigate this? It's like, man, if you so, ordered some so, seeds and built a fucking yeah. garden, think about how in interesting, one, those skill sets are. Two, think about the psychological benefit that you're getting from knowing you know what? I don't need to go to the store and get fucking tomatoes. And even if you're paycheck to paycheck, right? Because what is it? I, I saw somebody say, hey, if you're running low on groceries, like try not to go the first or the second because people on food stamps, that's when their food stamps get recharged and right. you can go back and buy the buy the food. They might be running on fumes now, right? right? Like, okay, so somebody in that position, imagine having a garden where instead of being stuck paycheck to paycheck thinking that's when I can get my food or food stamp to food stamp, that's when I can get my food. You have a garden just running. Right? You you don't you don't run on fumes for that. You run on fumes for other things, for luxury items instead of food. Food should never be a thing that you're fucking panicking about. I would tend to agree. I think it's just <clears throat> a matter of people don't want to put the time in or don't or just have never been exposed to it. Like they don't know. The, I, and I whether look, that's their fault or their parents' fault or who whatever the case is. I look at it pr fairly simply in this in the sense of there are a ton of people that spend a lot of time online and they're online okay. gambling. They're watching, you know, Netflix, they're watching sports. They're, they're spending a lot of yep. this time and their time is money. And they're essentially right? fucking off. They're essentially just fucking off. And basically they're just marking time until they're dead. Yeah. Right. Because you're not going to be on your deathbed going, man, I really wish I would have watched that new Netflix special. You're, you're <laughs> how, did I, how did I miss episode 36? Yeah. Like, Damn oh, it. Oh my God. I wish I would have known the stats on that fucking running back a little oh, bit more. God. That's not what you're going to be thinking about. No. You're going to be thinking about, man, I wish I would have spent more quality time with my fucking kids. I wish I would have spent more quality time with my wife. I wish I would have learned this fucking skill that I've always yeah. been interested in. So, Instead of just spending, and that's what I would say is, it's not the health of our society when we look at the wealth. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily it it it's it, it's not degrading because of how wealthy we are. It's how we actually waste our fucking time. Yeah, time and money are intrinsically fucking tied. They are welded together. And if you're wasting your time, you're wasting your fucking life. Yeah. If you're sitting in your bed and you're going man, I should or want to, oh, I wish I would have just learned how to fucking Do you know, manage my diet <clears throat> or gosh, I wish I was a little bit stronger or healthier or whatever it is. The only thing that's preventing you from doing it is quite literally you. And I've said this, so I said it on, on Mark's podcast right? the first time I was on. He asked, oh, why are you hopping on the assault bike? Or it wasn't an assault bike. It was a, just a bicycle, like a right. stationary bike, an hour every day, right? Doing, I was doing 1,000 calories every day. Right. On the bike. Um, and I said it, and it's a flippant statement to say, but it's also not when you start understanding the mindset. How fucking hard is it to do an hour's worth of physical effort a day? Right? So we have 24 hours in a day. Right. Okay. If you're working 10 hours out of those days, that's a lot. And then you're sleeping for, let's call it eight. Right? Eight. So now, Hopefully. Eight, eight, if you're so, lucky. Yeah. So that means you have six fucking hours of free time. Yeah. Let's do some simple math here. Okay, now you have kids, so they take up five and a half hours of that extra. You still have a half an hour of damn free time. You can carve it out. It's it's doable. I mean, you have Listen, two kids. I, I run I run a company of two hundred and twenty eight people. Obviously, like it just didn't grow itself overnight. I'm, yeah. I, I wish I was that lucky. I wish I just had a golden horseshoe up my ass, and that's why I, I was able to to do these things. They take an immense amount of discipline and dedication in yeah. order to put the appropriate amount of time and habit and it's it's time triage right yeah. so for me i've sacrificed some of the things in my life to grow the company over the last six years which is yes i, I you know i put on probably 
10 pounds that I'm not like super happy with, but I know that the time that I put in on the company that was directly an exchange on the front end on the, it's an exchange. All it is, is I spent less time on my body, more time on the company. I'm trying to balance that scale now, but I also have two little kids. So I had two little kids in the last six years. When people look at my life and you know, how lucky it's like, man, I have worked harder in the last six years of my life. Yeah. You know, and granted, I think most people know my past. Like I was a green beret. I spent the majority of my adult life overseas well, working. Those just come out of fucking vending machines. They though. just like come out of vending machines. Like <laughs> I know what hard work is. Fuck yeah. And it's excruciatingly difficult to do those things, but there is nothing in my life that has been physically harder than growing this company. Nothing. And I mean, I can see it. It's brutal. There's some days that come in and I'm like, Ooh, Ooh. I'm just going to sit here and, <laughs> And just listen. It's not, just not, it, not be a pain. So I look at people and I say, "What the fuck?" Like my wife is, she gets irritated with me because I have a saying that continues to go around my house, which is "suck it the fuck up." Yeah. Like suck it up. I've heard it's, that. Not even you've in heard your it house. before. Not even right? in your house. Everybody's heard it. <laughs> it's like you're feeling down on yourself. You, you know things aren't going your way. Cry me a fucking river, man. Like I've had you've had injuries. I've had injuries. I think mine's don't be a bitch, right? It's like, don't be a bitch. Suck it the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. Like get, get a little bit and say, like, well, I need, I need Jocko's podcast to give me discipline. It's like, you're fucking weak. Yeah. Shut the fuck up. You're just weak. It, and I don't know how many times I've heard things where it's like, where I've had these conversations with people. It's like, man, I wish it's like, you know what wishing's for? It's for fucking cartoons, man, because yeah. it doesn't work. And and when people hear us say that, or any of us in, coming from our background or in this scenario, right? Maybe they think it's heartless, but it's it's more of like I'm frustrated that you don't fucking get that it's that simple. It's that simple. Make a fucking choice. Just like be like, all right, cool. So I'm gonna sit down and watch this episode of whatever the shit. <clears throat> Fine. You want to watch that episode? Cool. How about you do some squats also? Or I've told people like, yeah, when I eat, because so I've had uh, pretty massive ankle injuries and and hip injuries on both hips. Right. <laughs> but I'm very, very, very flexible in my hips, my knees, and my ankles now. And people are like, oh, yeah, I mean, you know, how'd that happen or what kind of PT do you do? I'm like, no, it's not. I made a, a choice that for years, years, like three or four years in a row, every time I ate dinner or food, by myself or in a scenario that I was outside or something like training at the team, I would sit like a fucking, like that samurai sitting position, right? Or squat like third world squat all the time. And it was really shitty for the first couple of years, but it fixed you. It, fi <laughs> right. it fixed my hips and it fixed my ankle. Right. And you know what? People ask like, oh, well, you know, or I don't have time for it. Well, if you watched an episode of anything, you have time. Yeah. I, You're I, just not, I, you, I feel you, you aren't a priority to yourself. That's fine. I feel like an asshole, like not really, but people are always asking me the last week or so, have you been watching the the Tiger King or whatever it is? I'm like, dude, my my uh, my my partner was texting me at nine o'clock last night. And he's like, hey man, you want to go through, you want to read this contract? And I was like, man, I barely have enough mental capacity right now to read bedtime stories. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm done. Tapped like I'm out. tapped out. I, by nine o'clock, I'm up at five, typically five thirty, late point five thirty. It's about right. Cause I see the coffee making every morning. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I have a rhythm and a routine to my day. None of my rhythm and my routine in my day exist anywhere near Netflix. It yeah. doesn't even fucking <clears throat> come into my radar. Yeah. I, I don't, it, it's so outside of my habit that it doesn't exist for me. So for me to go out and grab that thing, it's, I have to actively think about it, remind myself. And by the time that I get to it, I'm like, why do I give a fuck? Yeah, right. Do I, I, I don't care. care. Like we have such a unique opportunity, I think. And even now with, with what's happening with social distancing mm -hmm. and COVID, my kids are home yep. all the time. Now I spend, if I'm not at work, I spend time with my kids. Yeah, I mean, you and, said it on Saturday. You're like, this is a dream come true, kind of. Kind of. For you personally. For, like, me, for me personally. For your personal life. 
is it is it a sacrifice to the business? Are there changes that we have to make? Yeah. Absolutely. Are we fortunate to be in the business of coffee? Yes. I love coffee, so it just so happens that, you know, I'm I'm in a perfect position to do what I want the majority of the day, but it still takes discipline. You still have to run your schedule, you still have to run your habits. My day is so habitually ingrained at this point to how I wake up and what I do for the first two hours, because I know after my first cup of coffee too, I'm the most active intellectually. Yeah. I know that I can solve my greatest problems that I have typically within the first two to three hours yeah. every day. Between coffee and food. Exactly. Yeah. So I know what do I have to do? I can't spend my time. Mm-hmm. What I do is I scroll through my inbox to make sure that I don't have any pressing issues. Mm-hmm. And then I start going through our website. I look at kind of what are the changes that we can make on the UX UI front because typically, you know, our guys from e-com will start to see things over Slack around 7.30 or 8, depending. Um, And then what I start doing is I start curating what do I need? What are my big movers? And I have it. I literally, what's my high value items that I have to start ticking off? If I'm not doing that, I call it time triage. If I'm not doing time triage actively every day, chopping the dead weight out of my schedule and then executing against the the massive ROIs in my life, return on my investments, I'm not going to have a great relationship with my kids. Well, and the important, I'm not going to have a successful company. And the important thing to hear is ROI on your life. Yeah. Right? Like people want to know how guys get into positions like you're in or Matt's in or John's in or I'm in where it's like, look, it's been that kind of process. Maybe not as well executed as you have, right? So we've all ended up at different points, but depending on how you're executing that kind of ROI for your life is going to determine the end result, right? The the third order effect of that is stuff like being fit, yeah. eating well, being happy, having a job you like. I always think about, I, I don't know why, it's a little bit morbid, but I always think about my last minute in life. I always think about my last minute. I don't know why. Because I want to think about what am I going to be thinking about? Yeah. And what I want that last minute of my life to be, I already have have my vision statement to what that last minute is. It's got to be, I have a smile on my face knowing I didn't leave one fucking thing on the table. Yeah. My kids are going to know with zero doubt that I love them, that I put every ounce and energy that I could into their lives and making them better and then making them better people. And more importantly, I won't sit there and go, I should have, because yeah. it, it wouldn't be possible. It is not possible for me that. to go at this time in my life yeah. if I were to fucking die tomorrow. Yeah. It is not a possibility for me to think in that last minute that I didn't do everything I could to curate the single best life I wanted. It's not possible for me. Now, if I have 5, 10, 15, 20, you know, 30, 40 years left on the planet, I know what I want to achieve in those, you know, those yeah. years. But there's not been a time since I left government service that I have not been trying to curate what I wanted in that regard. A lot of guys are, and a lot of people, I think, <clears throat> they just want, right? They just wish. They just want. Like, I wish I wish I had a better relationship with my kids. And it's a, I wish I had a better relationship with my partner. I, I wish. I feel it's like, like a, a lot of it is, is the, the logical conclusion, the logical thought process you're going to get from being hyper-involved in either TV, movies, social media, where you're living this voyeuristic version of reality. And it's like, look, motherfucker, you're living this life too. Yeah. You're here. Don't just be a watcher. Well, that's what they are. Yeah. They're they're spectators in it. You know, but everybody can be a not spectator. Yeah. Everybody can can be, anybody can be a participant. You can choose to get up off the bench and participate oh, yeah. in yeah. any in 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 your life. The team's got day. infinite players. <laughs> coach, <laughs> infinite coach, don't have players. to call you it's up. It's not. It's not <laughs> exclusive. Like, yeah. there, there's not a farm going yeah. on for yeah, the yeah. fucking selection to live an epic life. There's not a farm where they're like, all right, well, if you don't have a, you know, and a forty, and that's that's damn right. Because, yeah, not everybody can be a guy that 
was in SF. Not everybody can be a team guy. That's just reality. Just reality. Sorry. Sometimes it's time and place. Sometimes it's ability, whatever. Everybody can have a good life if you want it and you choose to pursue it. Yeah. My buddies, like some of my closest friends that I, I truly love and admire, they never served in the military. They don't have yeah. a day of you know, public service under their belt. One of my closest friends, he's been a river guide uh, in you know, the middle fork, you know, Dustin, oh, you yeah. met Dustin. Like he's, that guy's awesome. Yeah. He's fucking rad. Yeah. He spent thousands of days all the smiles in the middle of the fucking Frank church <laughs> wilderness area, rowing boats in quite literally one of the coolest, most beautiful places on the planet. Yeah. He is. And some people would look down their nose at it because they're like, ah, oh, well you just did X and you didn't fulfill the societal agreement of owning a home, having a truck you know, having 2.5 kids and a dog. And it's like, yeah. have, have you met the guy? Everybody. Yeah, it's not for everybody. You know, It's not for everybody. And and nobody's saying that you have to just be a river guide. Nobody's saying you, you have to be an astronaut. Nobody's saying you have to be anything but a mother. But if that's what you want to do, do it and enjoy it and do it really well. I think that's what it is. I think people, their vision statement for their own lives is polluted by social media and media just in general, yeah. right? Because... There's this forced ideal. This is where, this is what success is. This yeah. is what it looks like. And it's being fed this by multiple how you different will, streams. You will fit into society because right. of X. And it's, it's funny. I, I opted out of that whole thing uh, really early. <laughs> Me too. Very, 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 very early, right? That's, so That's probably like, a common denominator you know, amongst all the guys that come out of that special operations community. Is, Super easy. Is most of us between the ages of 17 and 21 are like, oh, I don't think so. I'm good. <laughs> this ain't I'm for all me. good on that. Ain't for, ain't for me, for dog. Me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's so funny because I was wearing Birkenstocks the other day and somebody was like, you wear Birkenstocks? I'm like, yeah, they're super comfortable shoes. I think I said, I, oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, suppressors and Birkenstocks, that's going to be like a, a whole thing that I'm into, right? Where, you know, I... I <laughs> I, I don't really pay a lot of attention to see we have a note. what's cool. Yeah. You know, because honestly that's that's a manufactured that's a manufactured existence yeah. based on uh, uh, marketing and based a bunch of people consuming. that are it, it is. And a lot of it is based on a false reality of a bunch of people that are really fucking shallow and self absorbed. Like I have no no desire. To, to be a Kardashian or anything close to that type of lifestyle, right? Because it's completely built on artificiality. It's it's an artificial existence. Yeah. There's no tangible, there's no tangible fulfillment outside of just money. Not even fulfillment. It's your reason for existing at that point is so that you can purchase products and make other people more wealthy. That's why that's why that lane of traffic exists. I completely, I completely agree. Now, I do own a company that does market to people, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but it, it, <laughs> but it is for me when I say that it's it's I, I mean, just listen to what we're saying, like yeah, right, like we're not coming at it from these shoes are cool because they're cool because I say they're cool. That's why you need to own them. Well, I think right? a lot of people do like when we look at even uh, the company of Black Rifle and we say, well, that's just a coffee and it's cool. It's like, well, people don't understand that we're manufacturers. They don't understand that, you know, I take a lot of pride in sourcing the coffees and roasting the coffees, the people that work the people here, that work here. It, 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 it's a, it, to be good at marketing is one thing to be good at marketing and manufacturing is a completely different thing. That's just being a good business. Yeah. Now when you're just marketing ship products, to market a ship product, that's totally different. I've taken that one too, where people are like, well, you just put, you know, veteran owned on stuff. I'm like, well, no, in all actuality, we were one of the first companies to put that out because I wanted people to know what type of a company we were. Yeah. I wanted people to know that we're pro second amendment. I wanted people to know that I'm a conservative. I wanted people to know because what I felt was it was important for the consumer purchasing that they knew who they were purchasing from. It's in the fucking name, well, Black Rifle Coffee Company. It's really hard for me to say, well, and I'm it's the fucking granola, you know, crunching, tree hugging. And you it's know, reflected I'm in, not. in who works here 
and how how the values are shown through the charities that are given out, right? Mm-hmm. And through how the coffee is made, who makes it, who prints the shirts, who does everything everywhere, right? The values are there. And it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody was in the service because they're not. No, they're not. 50% they're all of good the company, people. right? 50% of the company. And I think it's, I think it is one of those things not to go off on some type of tangent on that, but I think there's a big difference between people that are just marketing products they have no idea about and people that are marketing products that are their product there this is my product i put my name on it this is my company when we look at the company it's really you know it's it's matt myself and you know jared and these guys you know they're very much the media side of the business i'm very much the operational design aspect of the company and the way that we have a division of labor and this ebb Mm -hmm. and flow and how we kind of create the team in what we're trying to do is galvanize these ecosystems between customer and company. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with creating incredible content to go along with an incredible product. What I've always said is like, if you have an incredible product, you should try to create the greatest marketing component to make sure that it exemplifies what you're creating. Yeah. If you're not, you're failing. Well, right? and we talked about this when designing the future and outlook for FRA, right? Right. Like creating an ecosystem with a product that is the people Mm -hmm. and the things that we're touching, using, places we're going, and guys that we're talking to, guys and gals that we're talking to as the product, right? And then marketing the crap out of it because people deserve that kind of resource and that kind of cool shit to see and be part of and touch. Well, if I was the consumer on the other end, which I am, right? So before I was roasting coffee for other people, I was roasting coffee for myself. Yeah. I, I set off with the goal to create the best drip coffee I could ever roast for myself, <clears throat> not for other people. Yeah, single I, had, I had no ambitions whatsoever of selling coffee outside of just me and my circle of friends. Mm-hmm. Zero. I just wanted to roast incredible coffee. That was it. And from there, obviously, it's grown. But I think some people, they kind of mistake some of those things. You guys are great at marketing. Yeah, we're great at marketing. We're incredible manufacturers, which to me, those are just developing different skill sets within your own business ecosystem that continue to develop over time. If people think we're great marketers now, they they ain't seen fucking nothing yet, bro. I I remember talking about this in January. Like, you just watch out. Just watch the fuck out. Yeah. Because, And and that's going to be reflected here. Did it? At the company as well as FRA. Yeah, and, th- and that's part of the FRA expansion, right? It's yeah. It's like part of this entire thing, which is how do we expand and create media that you know inspires the American dream through hard work and adventure? That exactly. is the mission statement. Yeah. That's what we're trying to accomplish every yeah. day. We're going to inject that back in. A living ecosystem that people can participate in, either voyeuristically or actually participate in. Right. And I don't want to inspire people. When, when I look at this and I look at you know you being part of it and- you know, John and Andy and all these fucking incredible people. The cat man. Really just like sucking what's out of our heads because we go out and we're so fucking lucky. Like when we yeah. go hunting with guys like John Barklow, who's designing new equipment and gear for Sidka, holy crap. What a fucking phenomenal one. He's a great guy to hang out with because he's super fun. Two, the guy gives us a, a, a shit ton of gear, which is even better, right? But three, Goggle. like the guy's, a, he, he's just awesome human. He's an awesome human being. You can't help yeah. but be inspired by these people. Love that guy. And I'm, like when we when we put the list together of people, we're like, who do we want to have on this year? Who do we want to talk to? Right. right. That was another pinch, you know, pinch yourself moment where it's like, I can. These aren't like wish list names. Like these are people that yeah. I can call that are in my fucking phone yeah. that i could like, call this human it's crazy and i could be like I hey call man it's human yeah yeah like hey <laughs> can i have you on this show right and every single one of i think i came back that next week i yeah. was like yeah no they all said they do it they all said they do it like mark twight is a great example of that i've been a huge mark fight mark mark twight fan for before yeah. he was jim jones so i was telling you that story mm-hmm. where kiss or kill confessions of a serial climber oh yeah went to his book signing there's like 20 people in seattle He's an epic human. He's incredible. Epic. Incredible person. He's an incredible person. He'll be on the show. Yeah. Like, he'll as be soon on the as show. We can get him on. Yeah. As soon as he's we can get town. him on. He's he's one of those guys where 
I think when you look and listen to, you know, if, if, if you're participating in these things, these activities, this whole thing called life, yeah, it's, you know, it used to be a saying like tune out to tune in, right? It's like, you got to tune out of yeah. this Rat bullshit, race. just media component that's plugged in on Instagram and Facebook. You got to plug, you got to unplug from that. Especially because those things are such echo chambers. They right? are. Like, yeah. you know, if you're watching right wing news, you're, you're a person that's getting spun up by right wing stuff. If yeah. you're watching left wing news, you're a person that's getting spun up by left wing stuff. Cause that's how they, that's how they draw you in. That's how they get you in there. Cause you scream, Oh shit. Oh shit. And it echoes back. Yeah. Shit. Oh shit. Oh shit. Yeah. That's not what should be going on. And I think that it's cool all the people we're able to involve in this and have on and have people listen to or see is instead of being key holders, we can be door openers yeah. to information. Well, I think that's, that's the big, that's the big thing, which is, you know, FRA and what are we trying to accomplish with this? What are we trying to accomplish with the podcast? It's just providing access to interesting people. Yeah, Trevor's going to be a, a mainstay component. So you can continue to add you know, your personality and what type of value you're creating in your own life is only going to translate directly into what we're doing. So, you know, where can they find you? I think that's a good spot. We can tie this up because we've been, yeah. we're in an hour and some change. So hour and change is where great. it's uh Thompson pair sports. No. Nope. Or did you change it? I changed it. I made it what easier. Trevor dot P dot Thompson. Oh, okay. Yeah. Trevor. Super P. simple. P. Just my that's name right. on Instagram. Uh, it links to my website. And links to my photography stuff, which is Thompson Epic. Shots, yeah, yeah on uh, Instagram also. Uh, but uh, just check me out there if you want to see me, and I'll be back on FRA shows as well as some other stuff. Yeah, I mean you're all over the place. I'm kind of so, all over the place. Yeah, he's all over the place. Uh, so Trevor Thompson, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Obviously, you're Hell here yeah, all the time. So I mean, we're we're gonna have him on the show a lot more. Uh, the next one we're doing is going to be with the founder of TRX. So he'll be on the show for our next episode. Matt, myself, and Jared are going to do another one. Uh, John Dudley is coming up. He's in the shoot again. So John's going to be in one of the shows. We're going to get Andy, a bunch of the guys that are just basically Twite. same ecosystem. Mark Twite. Yep. We've got a laundry list of really, really fucking Super cool, cool interesting humans. Yes interesting humans so thanks a lot everybody thanks for tuning in